Welcome to Reason and Theology, a show dedicated to apologetics, discussions, interviews, debates, and more. The hosts are Catholic, but also welcome charitable conversations with Orthodox, Protestants, and non-Christians. And welcome to the Reason and Theology show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a Tuesday evening doing a show here on the papacy and Oriental Orthodoxy, joined by co-host Eric Ibarra, also contributor Elijah Yossi, a Eastern uh, Catholic, and Daniel Kakish, a subdeacon of the Oriental Orthodox Church. So uh, let's go ahead and dive in. If you don't mind, Eric, if you want to maybe just kind of introduce us to the subject of the papacy in relation to the Oriental Orthodox. Yeah, I'll be very quick because I'm very interested in subdeacon Daniel's comments. Uh, So in short, uh, a lot of people uh, think uh, before 1054, the Christian world was united in one uh, Eastern and Western communion. However, uh, to those who are more acquainted with history and who are um, more culturally uh, conscious of uh, Eastern history are well aware that this, this is kind of a very erroneous view of the uh, Christian history. So in the fifth century, you have two big schisms. One of them is much bigger than the other, but the first one is with uh, Nestorius um, and his legacy. He didn't really uh, start so much a, a massive church movement, but he certainly had a legacy that was taken up and it was to create a church that was more or less on board with uh, prior Christological orthodoxy, but it was highly questioned by m- many people in the West. Uh, to them, even the East was the West. Um, so you have the Nestorian or the Persian Church of the East, or the, which the Assyrian Church of the East, um, which again has a couple of multiplicities within it. Um, but the big one we're talking about here is the is the separation between uh, the the uh, the 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 the, the Miaphysites who did not accept the council of Chalcedon or Chalcedon and you know so that kind of took territory up in Egypt Syria temporarily in Palestine and even in other places in like Illyricum which was even under Roman jurisdiction uh, eventually as the centuries went on they became their own massive movement and uh, that is a, a, a very big thing separation in the church and so so Daniel here is a good friend of ours uh, we've known each other for years we've uh, been tossing ideas back and forth and uh, he's going to be telling us about uh, what happened and and why the oriental orthodox today have issues with the papacy the way it developed the way it was practiced back then etc cetera, etc cetera. You're on mute, I think, Michael. Sorry about that. That's so let's right. hear it. So Deacon, uh, go ahead and give us your understanding of this. Sure. Uh, I want to first say thank you to, to Eric um, for for being willing uh, to do this show. Uh, and uh, I can for for those of you watching, I consider Eric one of my teachers. Uh, I don't know if he knows that. And uh, he actually he actually just sent me this book that I'm really excited about. It's the Ephesus, the Ephesus uh, 431. Uh, I, I was reading it last night. I stayed up reading it. Um, I might use it on the show. Who knows? I knew you would. I knew you wouldn't <laughs> fall asleep before you finished it. <laughs> <laughs> it just came in yesterday. Um, so uh, I think I think that Oriental Orthodoxy. Uh, the sources for it are not, um, the majority of them are translated into Western languages. And then because of that, um, information on Oriental Orthodoxy is very scarce. So it's hard to know what Oriental Orthodoxy teaches. And I know I've, I hear like Protestants say that about Eastern Orthodoxy, but Oriental Orthodoxy is even more difficult. To, to learn about. So uh, the way that we kind of figure out what we believe and uh, regarding Rome or regarding 
a lot of other topics is just to read our own prayers, like the daily prayers we have, uh, notice things in the hymns um, uh, and stuff like that. And I think I've mentioned on other shows before that Rome still has a prevalent place in our tradition. And we still we have a prayer where we still list it as first in the diptychs in the name of its see. Um, we say Rome, Alexandria and Antioch. They're one of the prayers we do. So um, it's not that uh, we like removed it out of the tradition or anything. In the Syriac Orthodox tradition, is, uh, especially Saint Peter has a very special place. So uh, whereas you will you will hear from some Eastern traditions where they will say uh, Jesus um, like was talking about Peter's faith or not his person. In the Syriac tradition, it's both his person and his faith. Um, because in Syriac, there is no Petros Petra distinction. It's just Kepha or Kepa, depending which Syriac dialect you're using. Um, and the way that this discussion came up, actually, it came up in a WhatsApp group that we have and um, with Elijah and myself. And we were discussing um, the Pope's ability in the United Church before Chalcedon uh, whether or not he can universally, unilaterally excommunicate another patriarch from the entire body, not a particular excommunication. So um, it was in this context um, where the back and forth began. And, um, you know, I was providing points and, and my Catholic brothers were, were providing points. And then we, we agreed to discuss it on the show uh, here today um, regarding that and regarding whether or not one has to be in communion with the Bishop of Rome to be in the Ark, if you will. Elijah, did you have anything you wanted to, to say to start us out here as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, if I can just kick it off by uh, bringing up a topic that we can uh, throw out there that was on the group chat um, that I think Subdeacon would be interested in hearing about. Um, Maybe if uh, Eric wants to start off by giving an example, because he, he basically just hinted at it. Um, was there ever a time where the Pope unilaterally um, excommunicates a patriarch or a bishop um, specifically outside his jurisdiction? I, I know early on in the church, there was no such thing as jurisdictions between East and West, like at the time of Cyprian. Um, but if there was any, anything that you would have in mind that you want to share um, I think that would get the ball ball rolling there. You're on mute, Eric. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, we have to qualify what we're expecting to see in church history when it comes to the, uh, you know, the condemnation of a patriarch. You know, I mean we don't even see that today. And, and e e even if it, we were to see something like that today, um, I can guarantee you it would not be done by, uh, you know, with, with the Pope uh, hearing about a patriarch um, and then just, you know, writing his anathema on a sheet of paper. That's really, that's a crass expectation, expectation. Uh, the church fathers understood certain rules of justice that should apply in all circumstances. And one of those principles is that a, a, a problems should be resolved where they started. And uh, they, they shouldn't be brought, you know, far away for resolution. They should be resolved where they started. So the early bishops... Um, including the popes, um, they were very uh, they were very unhappy to see things get tossed up to high levels of high courts when when something can be dealt with on a local level, and, and so they I mean the, the fathers call it a, a violation of charity really because uh, a pastor who oversees his flock um, is the one who should manage the affairs in that flock. And it doesn't matter what kind of jurisdiction the Pope has. Uh, the Pope is a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
And so he has to stand around what else Christ established in the church. And as uh, Lumen Gentium teaches so clearly, um, the papacy is not the only divinely instituted office in the church. The episcopate, the whole episcopate is equally of divine institution. So every pope that enters into office, he, he has to stand around that. It, it's not as if a pope, when he gets into office, he says, oh, look at, you know, look at the, uh, this, this, this other instrument in the palm of my hands that I can do whatever I want with. That's simply just not how it goes, um, even with his universal jurisdiction. Like, for example, a, a local bishop has immediate, direct, uh, and unhindered jurisdiction over his local flock. But that doesn't mean that that gives him the right tomorrow to tell everybody that they can walk around naked, right? That, that, that would be absurd but he has full jurisdiction in his diocese, you see? So you can have full immediate jurisdiction, but not have access to certain prerogatives that would be contrary to the divine law. And so one of those divine laws is um, you can't condemn a man in his absence, okay? Now the church would eventually start doing this, but especially in the first, second, third century, this is not something that you want, you're going to see. It's not something we should see. Um, a man should stand trial and, and due process should be given. So this is one of the reasons why the Council of Sardica plays such an important role, uh, because in the fourth century, we see the, for the, not for the first time, but uh, f for when the church starts to get a more universal landscape, um, you see that there is a court that is available to bishops who feel like they've been double-crossed in under their synodal, uh, under their synodal um, sentences, uh, that those are not going to hold the last word. Bishops are given the opportunity to lodge an appeal and, and that is direct to the court of the See of Rome. And uh, this happens in the glorious time of St. Athanasius. And St. Athanasius the Great, who's a saint in all of our communions here, uh, is, um, was, was an, an attendance at these meetings where the, the Church of Rome was situated as the final arbiter um, in Episcopal trials. So I just want to say it's, it's not very, it's not a natural question to say, oh, let me go into the history and find when the Pope, you know, just took his wand and just, you know, uh, and just obliterated somebody. But you do see this happening. And so one of the, one of the instances is, uh, is uh, Nestorius of Constantinople. You know, that's a perfect example of somebody. But even, even then, there, there is a mediator because the, the Pope knows he can't just write a letter and give it to a bird to fly over to the east. So he, he writes to uh, Cyril of Alexandria and, and he gives Cyril his authority to then determine how this postage is going to make it to the Sea of Constantinople. And... Um, that came with a threat of excommunication, not just from the See of Rome, but from the entire church. So, you know, the question is, where, where you know, should the Pope have called an ecumenical council? Um, personally, if I was like the Pope's aide at the time in the chancery there, and he was going to give me a, a, a space to say something, I would have said, yeah, we should probably call an ecumenical council. Uh, but in that case, he decided to make a move on in the way that he did. Um, and he felt like he had the authority to do that. And, but that's really all going back to Sardica way before this. And so maybe uh, Subdeacon Daniel wants to talk about the Council of Sardica, Athanasius, and start there. Because I would say the Council of Sardica is really the, it's like the powerhouse 
from where the church starts to understand this idea of um, Roman jurisdiction, at least an appellant jurisdiction. Yeah, what are your thoughts there, uh, Subdeacon? Go ahead and jump in. Sure. Um, so thanks, Eric. And then uh, for real quick, though, about the Nestorius story, I don't like reading the letters after after Cyril uh, received the letter from Celestine. In his letters to the other bishops of the East, to John of Antioch, to Juvenal of Jerusalem, to... Uh, it was the other guy it was i wrote, i wrote it here somewhere the philippi um, the philippi i forgot his name though he was the bishop of philippi. yeah and then and then to to nestorius himself when he's actually submitting it to him in all of these cases nowhere does he say this is like this excommunication or this break of communion he which he refers it to he refers to it as is a, a universal one, but it's like when he's convincing these bishops, he's telling them, uh, I recommend that you break communion with him like me and Celestine are doing for the sake of being in communion with the majority of bishops, not anything about the See of Rome. So it's still like an option and he's still referring to Nestorius with honorifics at this time. And then the... And then John, as we know, remained in communion with Nestorius before Ephesus and was still in communion with Rome and Alexandria because the council hadn't happened yet. So there wasn't a universal excommunication. And even Celestine's excommunication was de facto, as uh, the book mentions, put on hold because when the emperor calls for a council, because Rome didn't call for it, the emperor did. So when the emperor calls for it, the Pope's, the Pope's excommunication gets put to the side. Um, that's interesting. If you think about, which we all believe, that the church is a divine institution, uh, that something like this can supersede the Bishop of Rome's prerogative. Um, and then regarding if we're going to talk about uh, St. Athanasius and the Council of Sardica, um, we were also talking about it in the groups. And I just want to say also for the viewers, when this conversation came up, the way it came up was this. Um, we were talking about an inter-Oriental Orthodox schism with the Indians. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but there are Indians in communion with Antioch and Indians who are not in communion with Antioch. So the Chalcedonian the in Antioch? No, no, oh. no. Oriental Orthodox. I was, I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, it's inter, inter Oriental Orthodox schism with these Indians. Uh, there's a, with the Indians who are not in communion with Antioch, there's a mutual excommunication between the Patriarch of Antioch and these Indians. So, those Indians, though, are still in communion with the other Oriental Orthodox sees like Alexandria, Armenia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, but they're not in communion with Antioch. So then uh, Elijah, my brother, he said, um, the Pope would have, uh, like would be useful in this situation. And then um, I think, and then somehow the conversation got to, well, we don't believe a patriarch can universally unilaterally excommunicate a, a see anyway. It would have to be a council. So it would be the same situation now, whereas with one patriarch excommunicating them, still it needs to be the whole body excommunicating them together for them to leave the whole body. So in Athanasius' case, in, in Sardica, this is, uh, I think we agreed that this was not... Uh, a matter of excommunication, but more of here is an appellate court, according to the ancient tradition, because that's what Sardica says, that going back, it's not starting there. But um, uh, to if anyone deposes a patriarch, such as the Arian councils that happened in Antioch, so then here is the appellate court for St. Athanasius. And we see it again with John Chrysostom and other times. Uh, but it didn't mean like that does not mean that Rome can like the, can do the opposite thing 
of unilaterally universally excommunicating someone. And then we see evidence for Sardica's interpretation um, from churches that like in their behavior very soon after. So uh, I mentioned this to Eric regarding the Assyrian Church of the East, the church in Persia, um, when they were still in communion. And in 410, they had a council where the canons of the fourth century councils, not Sardica, I have a list if anyone's interested. It, they are Ansira of 314, Neo Caesarea 314, Nicaea 325, Antioch 341, not the Arian one, Gangra 343, Laud Laodicea 365. These synods were transferred in 410 to the Church of the East in order for them to conform to the canons of these councils. Okay. And then in 424, 14 years later, they have another council. Uh, by the way, both of these councils for them are still to this day authoritative, not only to them, but also the participants of those councils are saints in the Chaldean church um, that is in communion with Rome. But uh, in this, the 424 council, it says that no one can appeal to any Western patriarch. Western for them means any Roman empire one, Antioch included. Um, when, if they have a problem with the patriarch of the Church of the East. So uh, now Catholic scholars, like one I sent to Eric, who is a liberal, I agree. Um, uh, he says that this is still reconcilable with Roman ecclesiology today. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't know, because I'm not, I'm not Catholic, but he makes the argument for it in his paper. So uh, in any case, that tells me two things. It tells me that Sardica was not intended to be this ecumenical council, but one in the local context of what was happening with St. Athanasius. And then another thing it tells me is um, regarding, regarding the Church of the East, uh, it's not it, like everyone stayed in communion with them after this for another 60 years. They, uh, a lot of people think they schismed in 431. That's not true. They schismed in 484. So uh, it, it wasn't until 484 that they schismed for Christological reasons, not ecclesiological. So if they are, they have this ecclesiology, this was a council, they weren't hiding it. The acts are known. Um, nobody mentioned anything to them. And I made this point also to my brothers that if Rome has any such council, and by the way, when the Church of the East is saying these things, they're not just saying it like that. They're saying, because the patriarch is Simon Peter, and he admonishes his brothers, and nobody can judge him, only Christ, no patriarch or council can judge him. This, we don't have any, in orthodoxy, it doesn't work. Like, we don't have anything like that for our patriarchs. And, and the early church doesn't have anything like that for, for the, the Roman pope. They have, if anyone has explicitly strong ecclesiology for any patriarch that early on, it's the Church of the East. Um, so I was saying that if, if we see this type of language for, let's say, the, the Pope of Rome, we would all be Catholic today because there's no arguing. There's no way of interpreting it in a different way. He's Peter. Everyone else is not. No one can judge him. No council, no other patriarchs. And they said it while in communion with the rest of us. Um, Elijah, did you want to jump in here and offer some comments? Otherwise, Eric, we'll, we'll go to you. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say, um, first, we have to understand the ecclesiology of each other's churches, um, because we could be talking past each other um, as we're trying to argue for our case. Um, and as Eric was saying, uh, we, as Catholics, we don't really have to go into the early church and find where the Pope is acting by himself um, putting, you know, the, the hammer down by himself, even, even in the case of the, uh, the synod, um, I'm sorry, even the case of C Celestine and Nestorius and, and St. Cyril and all them, the Pope first holds a synod in Rome before he decides what he's going to do. Uh, even in the case of Pope St. Uh, Stephen, 
and St. Cyprian, the Pope, holds a synod before he decides what he's going to do. So the brother bishops are always involved in, in all these things. There's always a collegiality. Um, but a lot of times when we're debating these things, we forget that and we just assume that, you know, at least Orthodox will assume that what we're trying to say is um, we're saying that the Pope did all this by himself. Uh, that's nonsense. I, I, don't, I don't think the Pope will ever do anything by himself. Um, it's just imprudent. Um, so that, that's what I would just add here as we're discussing this. Keep that in mind um, that there is that in the background as well, but I'll, I'll pass it on to Eric. Michael, did you have anything? No, I'm just sitting back. I, I, I do, but I, it's going to take us a little off course, so okay. I'm going to hold until later. Um, um, so I'll, I'll let y'all tease this one out first, though. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that we need to look at here is that the first time we have a documentary record of something is not the first time the thought is had, especially when the document that we have is appealing to a prior tradition. So um, the first time that, uh, you know, the Pope may have made a claim, the Pope of Rome made a claim to universal jurisdiction is probably not the first time it was ever done. So uh, the idea that if we had this, we'd all be Catholic. Well, what he means by that is if we happen to have a survived copy of something like that, um, then we would all be Catholic. But, you know, uh, this whole synod in 410 and 424, uh, for the most part, um, they were considered to be out of communion from the Catholic Church. And so, you know, to, to men in the fourth century, fifth century, rather, um, you know, what they decided and how they decided to organize um, really didn't make much of a difference because they were not in communion with the patriarchs you know, of the, uh, of the, of the church. So Rome being number one, uh, Alexandria being number two and Antioch being number three. And then all of those bishops underneath them and throughout the Roman empire, uh, they were not in communion with these churches. And um, so, you know, that they made a council with this idea of the patriarch being Peter that's not new at all. In fact, Pope Leo the Great understood that every metropolitan and every patriarch is a Peter to his region. So, you know, we don't have to go much. I mean, you, Pope Leo the Great is probably the most prominent voice for the exclusive and universal jurisdiction of the See of Rome because of the Petrine succession. And yet, in his own writings, he refers to the metro, the, the metropolitanate in Gaul and uh, and in Africa, as their own respective Peters. You know, so the fact that the Eastern Church in Syria in 424 would call their patriarch, he is Simon Peter to us, that that's no novelty at all. Um, what's what what's partially new there but it's not new either is that um there is no accountability to an autocephalous church and this this is the sort of thing that we saw in cyprian so really all we have to do is go back to cyprian to see the beginnings of the ecclesiology of the council of dadisho which which that's the name of the patriarch that uh was, you know, constantly being, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he was disregarded for many years and, and they kept appealing to the churches in, uh, under Antioch. And now they're like, no, we're no longer going to do that. We're going to just keep it at our patriarch and that's it. Well, that happened with Cyprian. Cyprian um, understood that in an even smaller unit, the church, the local church, the diocese with the bishop and his church, that that is a little papacy in itself, right? Because that's what that's what Cyprian said in the Council of Carthage in 257. He said that the only judge of a bishop is Christ. And the only time that that judgment will happen is when he returns. So that, that kind of ecclesial mentality is actually 
you know, we're talking 250. So that's almost 200 years before the Council of Dadisho. Um, and, and so go ahead, Michael, did you have a question? No, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't know. Okay. Go ahead and tease that out. Um, but you have alongside that the ecclesial mentality that the Roman see does have the check of accountability over any hierarch in the church. Now, there is resistance to that. Cyprian resisted it. The Council of Carthage resisted that. Um, but that doesn't mean everyone resisted that. And so the question is, if you have the presence of both beliefs, um, and that means that they're both antique, and so the question is, which one of them is right? They could both be wrong, but they both can't be right. And so whatever tradition was taken off into the Syriac church or the Syrian church then, as a Roman Catholic today, I would just simply say that they were mistaken to believe that they can ordain their patriarch as having absolutely no accountability whatsoever. Uh, that, that would just be not a novelty because obviously Cyprian taught that and Cyprian understood that from other peers in Africa. Um, but it was mistaken. And the position that has more, um, it has more patristic strength to it is the view that no, not, there is no hierarch. Uh, uh, only the Bishop of Rome is the court over which there is no further appeal. And, and, and so that's the position that Sardica takes. Sardica, Sardica, that's, you know, when you see the early commentators, and I disagree strongly with the idea that Sardica was just temporal for the situation with Athanasius. And I, I say that because you have bishops and deacons in Constantinople already citing the canons of Sardica uh, in a situation totally different in, in decades past the Council of Sardica. And when you get into the early councils of the East, like the Council of uh, Ephesus II, uh, uh, yeah, Ephesus II, uh, Eutychius um, lodged an appeal to Rome, and nobody said, whoa, 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 what are you doing lodging an appeal to Rome? And uh, he was uh, an Archimandrite in Constantinople, so kind of a bishop, you know, he was the leader of a monastery, but the patriarch of Constantinople was St. Flavian. And St. Flavian expressed no shock that, that Eutychius was owed the right of review. He was owed the right of review. Um, and nobody there said, oh, we don't know what that means. Where are you getting that from? So they are already in the, in the chancery of Constantinople. They, they knew quite well the Sardican uh, privilege, even though we don't hear them talk about the Council of Sardica, we do see that in some of the emperors when they're changing letters. Um, but mostly you hear it referred to as the Nicene canons, because Rome, for some reason, uh, had the canons of Nicaea and the canons of Sardica um, squished together. And so often the popes would refer to the Nicene canons when they were really referring to the canons of Sardica. But in any case, the popes thought that these were universally valid. So anybody, could, anybody can appeal to these canons. And, and that's how it was understood, you know, certainly by Athanasius, certainly by Hosius, the, 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 the Bishop of Cordoba. The last thing I would say is that I disagree with Subdeacon Daniel on the character of the letters from St. Cyril of Alexandria to the Eastern Patriarchs, uh, John of Antioch, and uh, let's see, I have it in front of me, and you tell me what this sounds like. He says, unless you do this, and he means by this, recant within the 10 days. He says, unless you do this by the time prescribed in the letter of our aforementioned most pious and religious brother and fellow minister, Celestine, Bishop of the Church of the Romans, know that you have neither part nor lot with us, nor place nor account among the priests and bishops of God. So in my reading, I, 
I just see I just see that exactly as how Pope Celestine said it, which was that he would really have no spot in the universal church anymore. And uh, we know that St. Cyril understood it that way, because when uh, Emperor Theodosius II called the council in Ephesus, Cyril was confused as to what he should do. And he wrote a letter to Pope Celestine saying, hey, this man has already been condemned. Is it even possible for an ecumenical council to re-examine him? So why would, why would Cyril be urged to ask that question if he thought it was just a Roman and an Alexandrine exclusion? You know, so anyway, I think I could stop there because I think we covered... I, um... I had a couple comments that I wanted to make real quick and maybe get Subdeacon's thoughts on everything that you just said and also what I'm going to piggyback off of what you just said and contribute here. Um, so when you look at the letter between Celestine and Cyril of Alexandria, 431, towards the end when he talks about, you know, in 10 days of receipt, uh, Nestorius is going to be excommunicated if he doesn't publicly repent. Um, he says this, we have written the same to our brothers and fellow bishops, John, Rufus, Juvenal, and Flavian. So our judgment about him, or rather the divine sentence of our Christ, may be known. So he's not just cutting him off from communion with Rome. He's saying the divine sentence of Christ is made known. So my first question would be, is that something every patriarch could say? When a patriarch cuts somebody off from communion with them, are they making known the divine sentence of Christ? And then number two in the letter from Celestine to Nestorius, right around the same time, um, it says this. This is, again, Celestine to Nestorius. Take heed that unless you about Jesus Christ our God, what the Romans, Alexandrian, and Universal Catholic Church holds, and what up to your time was held by the Holy Church of Constantinople, and if within 10 days after the receipt of this, you do not openly and in writing condemn this of pious novelty, which tends to undo what the ancient scriptures join, you're excluded from the communion of the whole Catholic Church. So again, is this something that every bishop, every patriarch can do? Can they, I know we all agree they can exclude them from their communion, but can every patriarch and bishop say that you are now excluded from the whole Catholic Church? I guess that would be my question. So go ahead, uh, Subdeacon. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. So first, I want to say regarding Eric's first point about the Church of the East in that time, they were in communion with us. They were they stopped being in communion in 484. So uh, we even canonize uh, their saints and patriarchs up until 484. Um, so so they were actually still in communion, especially with Antioch. And then um, and when we talk about what has more patristic weight, um, which, which view. I think that we need to, just like we tell Protestants all the time, we need to interpret um, the text, whether it's the Bible or the councils or whatever it is, according to how it was applied, not according to what we think it means. So when we see it applied in a certain way, that's probably how it was understood by those people. And let me clarify what I meant about Sardica. I did not mean that it was temporal, um, just in, in generally speaking. What I meant was in the case of the Church of the East, it wasn't applicable or important for them to receive that. But in our case, as Roman Christians, of course it was, as we see it even in, in our own situation where Cyril appeals to Celestine, obviously. Or when, uh, like you mentioned, you Eutyches or even uh, Flavian of Constantinople. And we see it all the time after that being used. So uh, absolutely, I agree with you. Um, and then for the question about Celestine and his the way he speaks with Nestorius and the way Cyril communicates Celestine's position to Nestorius. Uh, Michael and Eric, an answer to your question would be, yes, we say this, the, patri the patriarch of Antioch, if you read his excommunications of these Indians, they are even stronger than this. Not only are they outside of the Ark, but they even are, they depose themselves and no longer even have priesthood because they cut themselves off from the source. 
from Peter himself. And he appeals explicitly to his Petrine authority for that. Okay, so I agree with you that, that the tone is that way, but it only matters if the others recognize it. Otherwise, it's just words, right? Because we can all say that, but it only matters how if it's if, um, in application. So we see this. We see Cyril telling Nestorius these strong worded things from Celestine. But then when Cyril is talking to John, when Cyril is talking to this juvenile, he's not using that language with them about Nestorius. Like he says here to John, when he's writing to him about what Celestine said, he tells him, accordingly, it is the duty of your reverence to consider what is advantageous. For we shall follow the judgments from Pope Celestine, fearing to slip away from the communion of so many bishops. And then you see the, uh, it's very similar weak language, if we want to call it that, to the other, it's actually even weaker to juvenile. So um, it's like, and, and, and uh, John didn't do it anyway. And he stayed in communion. No one excommunicated him until Ephesus happened. So he stayed in communion. And then not just that, even in, even in, by the time they get to Ephesus, which is after the two, the two weeks or whatever Celestine gave him, they're still using honorifics. So nobody even recognized it um, because the council was going to happen. Um, so we don't see like, okay, let's say, let's say in Oriental Orthodoxy, there was a, a church that, that sided with Antioch against those Indians. It doesn't mean that that becomes the dogma of, of what's going on here. It just means that's what they're taking sides in that situation. Obviously, I'm against Nestorius. But what I'm saying is, if Cyril and Celestine recognize the excommunication, it doesn't mean it's a universal one. Because as long as you have John of Antioch in communion with Cyril and Celestine, which he was at that time, and with Nestorius, clearly that means it's not universal. So I have one comment and then one question. Um, you know, when he wrote about the this 10 days upon receipt, um, this was before he was made aware that there was a convoking of a council uh, by the emperor. So he went ahead and put his excommunication, he went ahead and deferred it for the sake of the entire body to be involved and participate in the matter in an ec ecumenical council. So I guess I don't see an issue there. The fact that, you know, he wasn't excommunicated 10 days later. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Um, but then my question is, you mentioned that your patriarch right now, or at least patriarch in, in Antioch, you said, would use this kind of strong language, if not stronger language. That's fine. Um, I guess my question would be, who other than the Bishop of Rome in the first millennium used this kind of strong language and excommunicated people from the entire church? Are there examples of others other than the Bishop of Rome in the first millennium? That's a good question. Um, I would say... Uh, regarding the, the thing you said about Celestine, what I learned is from actually from this book here, uh, from the Richard Price book, is that um, he did, Pope Celestine didn't uh, like put it away or whatever. It was the emperor, the emperor's de declaration of that there is an ecumenical council coming after Celestine's judgment superseded Celestine's judgment. And he didn't have a choice because the emperor liked Nestorius and he wanted him to stay. So uh, that was one thing. The, uh, uh, regarding, regarding if we see it that early, I have to look into that. I don't know. I think, yeah. I, I think that the excommunication, um, yeah, I, I, would say, I would say it's something that we should, we should look into. Uh, sure. I know that it, councils did that, yes. I can't think of another. Yeah, page. no, I'm, I'm talking about a, a yeah. specific yeah. single bishop. Now, of... is it possible that the emperor, if that's true, if the emperor could have been mistaken, uh, not, not mistaken, but he could have just had a wrong view. Um, maybe he is going against papal supremacy here, and he's just no different than maybe, say, and Arius, who's opposing Homoousios, you know, he, just because he's opposing uh, or disregarding the excommunication of the Pope doesn't mean that that position is orthodox. In other words, that it's okay to now disagree with 
those that the Pope has communicated from the entire body. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see it as um, I see it as consistent with other emperors' behavior, though. I don't see another emperor where they did something different. Even Justinian, who is like probably one of the most papal friendly emperors, was still did things to impose himself onto the Pope. Sure. Um, and uh, even if you if you look at um, also actually again Theodosius II, he does it again uh, with Dioscoros later. So uh, I don't and and his uh, his one of his predecessors Theodosius the first in 381. Um, I don't see anything from him that would that would uh, like make me think the other way. It seems like Constantine and whatever few Orthodox emperors there were after him, if he was Orthodox. Uh, I don't see I, don't, I just see that, that that would be consistent with how emperors behave. But that doesn't tell us theology. It just tells us he's an emperor. Exactly. It doesn't tell us whether their behavior is right or wrong. Assuming right. those facts are correct. Right. It doesn't tell us whether it's right. And that's kind of what I'm wanting to get at. I'm sorry to interject there so much. No, Eric. Go you. ahead and follow up on what you heard uh, from Subdeacon Daniel and then Elijah will get your comments. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so a couple of things what I would say is that. When I said that the Church of the East that took these, uh, you know, the beliefs with them about Peter being the highest and, you know, being there, there being no judgment above that, I meant when it, when, when and if that ever became known by the Roman See, that would have never been tolerated. So you could have a hundred years where the cro the paths are never crossed, right? Because, I mean, how long did Nestorius hold his, his his heresy? Probably since well before he was officially excommunicated. So he was in communion with the Catholic Church while he was holding his heresy. So you could have that with an individual. You could have that with a, a synod. You could have that with a autocephalous church where they synodally hold to beliefs that are erroneous um um and once that becomes formally known they're known to be excluded from the church but in this case there was other reasons why those churches were excluded so that's what i meant by uh that where they're not in communion meaning that those those teachings of that synod did not reflect anything in relation to the church in the uh, the catholic church as it was understood by the patriarchs which would they they would refer to as the Western patriarchs. Um, so that's what I meant by that. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is that we do get a little tripped up here about the language, because I mean, what are you, ex what are we expecting? Um, what are we expecting Pope Celestine to, to write to the other bishops of, of the East that, Hey, I wrote a letter um, to Nestorius and, uh, I'm excommunicating him, and you just need to you just need to recognize that. Well, that's just again. Now we're now we're going into uh, you know we're, we're going into uh, an expectation which is not natural. Uh, I mean, even today, if a pope is going to write a letter to nearby patriarchs, let's say we're back in in the time when there was no phones and there was no instant communication, the letters that all the popes wrote to other patriarchs going into the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th century always carried this gentle prowess and, hey, you should assemble your synod and read aloud the, the canons or, or, the sen or the decisions of the Roman synod and then formally accept it in your church. Now, if Pope Nicholas I did that, in the ninth century, are you going to say that he was simply just nudging them and inviting them to uh, make their own decisions for themselves? No, no scholar says that. So it goes both ways. In other words, the language can be read either way. It can be read as so tender and inviting so as to completely deny that there's coercive jurisdiction behind it, but you can have the same language used by popes who everyone knows and nobody questions, but understood that 
this was just part of diplomacy. This was just part of charity. You don't, you don't just put on full blast, you know, hey, you know, this. Now, there were times that that happened, and we do have examples of that. But we have to be careful with the language. So I would just turn this around. And I would say that the, you're interpreting the language of Pope Celestine to Cyril, Pope Celestine to Nestorius as this, you know, very powerful and authoritarian language because um, you feel, you, you interpret that to mean, well, that's just what you do when you're writing to the people who are in the dispute. But when you're writing to others, then you kind of talk the way it really is. I would just turn that around and I would just say that, no, the way that they're talking to the, uh, to, to Nestorius is the way that it really is. And that the way they're writing to John and Philippi and, 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 uh, and you know, and yeah, Antioch, John and Antioch and the other Eastern churches, that is dressed, that is dressed in, you know, diplomacy, charity, and more of a, more of a, you know, we request you to recognize this, you know, in other words, we're, we're bringing to notice certain troubles in the church. It would be advantageous to you to examine what we're doing here, because it would be detrimental to lose the communion of the West. I mean, I don't see that as somehow subtracting from anything I've said. Uh, the other thing I would say is I've read through Price's uh, book and, uh, you know, on, on the, the, the Acts of the Council of Ephesus. And I, I don't agree with him that the emperor's fiat puts a stop to the papal judgment. Uh, I, there's nothing in the teaching of Jesus about imperial intervention in ecclesiastical judgment. So there's absolutely no foundation for that in the Holy Scripture. There's absolutely no foundation for that in the early fathers. And we know this because of the way Athanasius responds to the emperors, the ways that, uh, that uh, later on, this is our church, Maximus responds to the emperors. So uh, if and ever if ever the church ever said okay fine let's let's reschedule this or court is um you know adjourned or we're going to re you know we're going to this is a mistrial and that the emperors do it that's the church acquiescing it's never the church under jurisdiction of the state never never so in this case there was a, a bit of a miscommunication when Pope Celestine sent his letter to uh, Nestorius, well, first he sent it to, to uh, Cyril. Cyril then sent people with all the postage with the letters of the Pope and his own letters to, to the East and to the others, other, other bishops in the East. Um, the, the emperor didn't know about this. He didn't know about the, this papal sentence. Uh, Nestorius had come under the uh, knowledge of it, and uh, he consulted with the emperor about this, and the emperor decided to call an ecumenical council, not just for the issues that the pope was accusing Nestorius over, but also other issues that were happening that required a council to, to look at. And so when the emperor called a council, in uh, 429, I want to say, um, or 430, uh, I forget which month it was, uh, he sent out the summons to all the churches, and then the, then the legates of Cyril came into the east. And so when, Cyril, when Cyril's legates arrived in the east, um, they, were, they heard, oh, there's going to be a new trial for Nestorius in an ecumenical council. Sorry, I've got the hiccups here. Um, so there was a bit of a miscommunication here that nobody foresaw. The Pope did not foresee the calling of an ecumenical council. The emperor did not foresee the, the Pope's judgment. And so there was a bit of a spontaneous coincidence happening here. Now, 
the Pope got he he received the summons to appear at the Council of Ephesus. And when the Pope received that, he he prepared legates to go to the council because he figured, well, hey, um, you know, number he told Cyril it's better for Nestorius because in this case, there's higher pressure on him to repent, and in the presence of many people, and uh, there's going to be more more of the leadership of the church there um, to all acknowledge this, and that we don't have to keep writing everywhere to. To, to, to let people know what's going on. Popes, you know, that's what he should have done in the first place is petition the emperor for an ecumenical council. So what we have here is the Pope acquiescing to this new council. He's being a diplomat like any thinking man should be. Remember, even a dictator knows that it takes wisdom to run uh, an empire. Um, you're, you're not going to sit you, when you look at a dictator and I don't want to compare a dictator to the Pope, but if you take a dictator and he's constantly taking advice from his college of counselors, you're not going to then say, well, the college of counselors has superior jurisdiction over the emperor, right? Or the dictator. So, you know, certain times the popes are going to say, okay, we'll, we'll go with that plan or all right, we'll do this. That doesn't mean that now what caused him to do that has superior jurisdiction. So we would never say, as a Catholic, we would never say that the emperor had jurisdiction. Now, at this time in the church, there was a sense in which the emperor had divine authority. And that's a little new to modern ears, but back then they just understood that in the realm the emperor had not just authority over the state, but even authority in the church because he was a member of the church and he was a ruler of the realm. So he had the right to call these councils. Now he didn't have a right to um, talk, you know, to give the subjects that are discussed and he did not have the right to vote even though many of them practically uh, did. Um, but they didn't have a right to those things, but they did have a right to call a council. And, and this kind of mirrored the senatorial procedure in Rome. So they were just taking the Senate procedure and bringing it into the church. And the, all, the church accepted it because, hey, this would be all the more useful to us. This is wise. This is intelligent. This is good. This is holy. We can take a thing from the empire and, and baptize it. Um, so, yeah, I, that's what I would say. I, but I would really stress that the language there, that's highly subjective, highly subjective to take the language, because in seriousness, local synods like the Council of Arles 314, that's a local council, they're using powerful language. God is in our midst. Our judgments are God's judgments, right? But then they write their letter to the Rome, to the Pope saying, okay, well, it's your responsibility to now let this known to the whole church. Okay, so anyway, um, I could leave it there and see what, what we have, you know, see what your paddle says to my ping pong. I think uh, Elijah also had some comments there uh, real quick before you respond there, Subdeacon. Yeah, just uh, real quick. So I would say, um, well, th this is, uh, two points I want to make. So first the Persian Senate, going back to that, and I'll go back to Celestine and stuff, but you mentioned the patriarch um, saw uh, they, they resurrected a patriarch to kind of have the role of the Pope in, in a sense, the way we understand the Pope um, and no one can judge him. Uh, and he had this full on authority and, and distinct authority from his bishops. Uh, well, I think that's something that they're looking at from a model that they've seen so you know i would argue that that really points to the papacy because they're they're on the on their own side here and they're saying look we don't care about the rest of you guys we're just going to start our own church here our own little section of the church um and they they might be looking at a model from the universal church where there's a head and then you know there's bishops and the head would be the pope and the bishops would be the body and they'd say we're just going to imitate that same model uh, where the patriarch, no one can judge him, just like the Roman Pope, no one could judge him. Um, so one, one can argue that model was taken from the universal church. Um, and the second point, going back to Celestine, um, the early popes from the first century on to 
the time of Celestine, they saw themselves as being head of the whole universal church. Their language is clear, right? And so the question is, how did St. Celestine understand the excommunication of Nestorius? How did he understand it? And would St. Cyril be ignorant of the way St. Celestine is understanding that excommunication? Um, I, I don't think he would. I think he's purposely going to St. Celestine, knowing what St. Celestine believes, and I, and I would say that St. Cyril believes the same thing, that if Rome excommunicates someone, they're excommunicated from the universal church, because he wouldn't go to St. Celestine um, for a sort of a, a local excommunication or separation from Rome and Alexandria. He would want to go to him and put the hammer down on this guy because he doesn't like him at all, right? Um, and my point really hinders goes back to Celestine understanding his authority to be universal. Um, and, and he's not alone here. If you go back to the other popes, um, even Pope Victor, when he excommunicated the Eastern churches, he didn't think that he was excommunicating them from Rome. He thought he was excommunicating from the universal church. And so going back to his predecessors, if you look at his predecessors, how did they understand their role in relation to the universal church? And the way they would is, if, if you're excommunicated, you're excommunicated from the church. If you're brought back, you're brought back into the church and no one can say anything, um, which is the case of Athanasius as well, as you know, in, in, the, in Sardica and that. So that, those were my, uh, my only points I wanted to share. Go ahead, Subdeacon. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, so regarding what you said, Eric, about the strong language, uh, take it take it the opposite for Nestorius is the real one, not for the other bishops. I agree, actually. I agree with that. Uh, my point wasn't that. My point was that it was um, in application, you see, if, if the Pope today excommunicates the Chaldean patriarch, it would be obligatory for all the other Catholic patriarchs to also excommunicate him. This is not what the, what happened here. So when when Celestine and Cyril truly intended to with their language to be fully real and binding to excommunicate Nestorius, the other patriarchs did not do that. So uh, not only did they not do that, but even Cyril himself continued using honorifics with his own enemy that he believed, I agree with, with Ihab, that Cyril's not ignorant, but he's still using honorifics with him. Now, uh, the imperial thing you mentioned too, regarding the place of the emperor, if anyone agrees with you, it is the Oriental Orthodox. Um, we are the biggest proponents of that view uh, to the point that we began to call the Chalcedonians uh, Melkaye, which means like, followers of the of the king um so so absolutely that's the uh, that whole concept started in the fourth century and didn't last for us until like the the fifth <laughs> so it was like one century long who cares about the emperor um i was just using it as an example of uh in terms of when we see i wasn't i wasn't trying to say that the emperor's view superseded any excommunication as a divine institution, just as a view of practice within Christendom to see how it was happening. Now, the, the thing about communion, I want to say also, when you have intercommunion with an excommunicated patriarch, excommunicated by the Roman bishop, that's not new either. That's not the, that's not the first time we see it with Nestorius. We saw it before, as we always mention, uh, with the Miletius situation or with Athanasius or with um, Theophilus of Alexandria and these other times where it's happened. Um, th this, is, this is what I mean, that uh, there has to be, even if I was Catholic, I would say, just to make sense of history, logically, there has to be, uh, a difference between Roman particular excommunication and universal. And if I was Catholic, I would say that these early examples are particular. 
even though universal could have been possible if I was Catholic, these cases specifically are not. But me not being Catholic, I would say that also shows that there isn't universal uh, excommunication just by the Roman bishop. Even the victor example that Ihab gave, I always thought that to be particular anyway. Um, now, uh, there's other things you guys mentioned too. I think the Church of the East, Ihab mentioned it, um, that uh, he said it was modeled after something. And I think Ihab would agree that that's his speculation because there's not evidence. But um, actually, I think it, when we read the this, this Synod, they're, they're kind of talking about how what they're doing is an innovation. If you read the words they're saying, they say that although the, our Western fathers and our Eastern fathers, meaning their ancestors, did, like received this way of being able to appeal. They used to always appeal to the Patriarch of Antioch. Um, now we realize that we shouldn't have been doing that even though that's what we received. Um, so I think that's interesting. It kind of tells them, I, I, like, I want you guys to know too, I don't agree with that council um, because it's, we don't have anything in this, we don't have this ecclesiology where there's no council that can't judge a patriarch or something like that. Uh, but I'm just using it as an example of, of a, a church in communion with us who had a different ecclesiology in a way, because we see that in the early church. We, I guess we just have to be honest. Like it's not, it's not this like uh, black and white thing. There's a lot of gray area. There are inconsistencies all the time. Um, and, and this just came up again. I, it's not about, uh, it's not about me well, like, not, I'm happy we're doing the show because uh, you guys pointed to a lot of uh, interesting things, but I didn't intend it to be like, I'm trying to com convince you guys that, th that this is an innovation. Well, I'm more anti orthodox. You already know what I think. But um, just that we can't also assume that all of the early Christians, especially in the East, knew about whatever Rome is claiming or not claiming, right? Um, and then also I want to say, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I think I think that's it. I think that's it for me. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to say a couple things. By the way, I appreciate the clarifications. Those are all helpful. Um, whoa, where did Daniel go? I think he's still there. Disappear. Okay. 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 <laughs> there he is. All right. Oh, yeah. Take a break if you got to. I, I just want to turn I the light on. Eyes. I closed my eyes and you were there. And then I opened them and you were gone. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the, I guess the first thing I would say is let's let's go back to this issue of the recognition. Right. Um, you know, Pope Celestine uh, writes this letter. Uh, well, really, he gets feedback from from Cyril. Uh, about Nestorius, and he wasn't quick to respond. You know, um, Celestine kind of ignored Cyril for for quite some time, until Cyril was like the you know the 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 he was begging the Pope to 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 act upon this. And um, when Cyril wrote that letter, I think that it, we should all agree, and I think Richard Price agrees with this. Even I mean, he's Roman Catholic, but from Let's be let's be real here. Uh, Richard Price is probably he 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 writes like a secularist almost. He he's he doesn't care where his where the research puts him. He just says it like it is. So I feel confident in appealing to him without the risk of bias overly. Um, but even Richard Price recognizes that the Pope understood that he was equipped not by the church, not by canons, you know, not by the circumstances, but he was equipped by a divine ordination that stretches back to when Christ was still with us in the flesh. And he gave to Peter the keys of the kingdom, the powers to bind and loose, the office of the rock, the key bearer, the one to shepherd the universal church. Uh, the Bishop of Rome understood that he was equipped, endowed 
with that authority um, to make enactments that were that would have implications everywhere in the church. Richard Price knows that. Um, even Eastern Orthodox scholar, uh, Father, ooh, he wrote the book on Cyril of Alexandria. It's the one that everybody, uh, um, McGuckin, there we go. Um, Father John McGuckin even understands that what's going on with Pope Celestine is he really thinks that he's equipped to, to make this judgment and that this judgment is going to sizzle through into, it's going to be written into stone um, in the East, regardless of what the Eastern churches are going to say. And I would argue that Cyril has that view as well. So let's just, let me just put that on the table and then let's go to this issue of, well, how did Antioch receive it? How did the Philippines receive it? How did the other churches receive this? Well, for starters, um, the Pope's, the Pope's letter is basically saying that what Nestorius believes is a heresy. So if the Bishop of Ephesus disagrees with that, then the Bishop of Ephesus is walking into the, into the target, into the, what is it, what's it called? The middle of the target. Uh, he's walking right into the bullseye. eye. Of, he's walking right into the bullseye. In other words, um, if he's going to sit by and say, well, the Pope writes that. Yeah. But I've got the prerogative as the patriarch of my own church to kind of just, you know, hand wave it, you know, or I'll put it on my desk and wait for whatever month I want to take it serious. Well, now he's walking into the bullseye because everybody has everybody has the responsibility to maintain an orthodox stature. And that means cleaning out those in your association who are heretics. So if you're, if, if John was going to not receive the papal letter, he was going to become the story is number two. In other words, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, and if the Philippians said, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't receive it, you know, well, they were going to become a, a Nestorius number three. In this case though, we see that the papal church, the, the Pope Celestine sent envoys to this council. So everybody kind of knew, okay, um, there's, this isn't the final word. The Pope is even going along with a, a, a rescheduling this thing, right? Interestingly enough, though, when Nestorius makes it to Ephesus, they don't allow him in the church for the feast of, uh, uh, I think it was uh, East, wasn't it? Was it Lent? I can't remember, but it was the it was a major feast, and the churches in Ephesus would not allow him into the church even before the council began. And uh, um, so, I'm not saying that they, you know, somebody could say, well, that the bishops of Eph the bishop of Ephesus has the right to the, to make that decision for his church, right? But I'm just pointing that out to show that they read the papal letter and they understood, okay, this man's no good. Um, until he proves himself otherwise, this man's no good. Uh, but it's consistent with either perspective. You could take it, well, Memnon just took advantage of his own prerogative to not let Nestorius in his church, right? Um, or you could take it as they read the papal letter and the Cyrillian letter, and they said, this is serious business here. The Pope of Rome has got his eye on somebody. And, and it's not good. It, it, it either is consistent with that. So uh, what the, and, it, and let me make just one more point about this issue of authority in the church. You know, the, the Synod of the Disho in 424, that's just a Cyprianic view. It's not really a, it's not really a papal view. Um, it's just a Cyprianic view applied to the Metropolia or to the Patriarchia, whichever it is. Um, you know, Cyprian thought that the local church was a little Vatican city. Nobody could penetrate it. You know, the only judge is Christ. And at the end of time, of course, that was superseded, right? You have St. Stephen, you've got St. Dionysius of Alexandria. You've got other writers, historians in the later third and fourth century that say Cyprian was wrong. He was just wrong. Yeah, he was in communion with the church, but he was wrong, you know. And this is why it's so important for Catholics to talk about the development of doctrine. I know that this sounds like 
whenever we can't bridge together the past and the present, we just throw this card down the development of doctrine. But here's the thing. St. John Henry Newman understood that every one of us, the Protestants, the Oriental Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, everybody depends on doctrinal development. Why? Because you have a multiplicity of views. Like you said, it's not, it wasn't black and white all the time. But that doesn't mean that the church is now paralyzed and put in prison in, in gray. You can eventually get to a black and white on certain issues. So, for example, the, 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 the doctrine of Christ, uh, whether he was homoousios with the father or if he was homoousios or if he was another kind of a relationship to the father, you have gray you have gray, not just at, not just before Nicaea, after Nicaea, um, and, and and but eventually the church would draw a big fat black line, eventually, and then everybody was on board with it, and nobody said, well, you know, things, you know, people were in communion with us that were more gray about this, so maybe we should reopen the lid. No, no. So eventually, in the in the Catholic West, the Sardican theory would would go through a metamorphosis to be even greater and greater. Secular historians call this the papal expansionism. So there was resistance to the papacy even in Africa, even in Africa in 424, 425. They said, "Hey, no more appeals to to Rome, to Rome." They were getting tired of the Pope meddling into affairs in Africa. So they sent a big fat letter to Pope Celestine saying, stay out of our business, in other words. Um, so, okay, so Catholics, what do you say about that? You know, well, I can't deny what, I mean, they're writing a big fat letter to say to the Pope, to, they, they did not believe in immediate direct universal jurisdiction at that point, right? Um, but it was short lived. It was very short-lived because the African church later, under the best canonists, like, for example, Ferrandus, which I know is, he's, he's, he's bad news bear for the Oriental Orthodox because he, he wrote a big defense of the three chapters. But he was uh, an African canonist, and he said, no, Rome, Rome, had, uh, you know, Rome has jurisdiction over Africa, and we do everything at, at the assistance of Rome and all appeals go to Rome. So yeah, you had resistances and you had people putting obstructions in place so that papal prerogatives were kind of, you know, put down in a sense. But as Father Klaus Schatz says in his book, and I think this is an excellent observation, what we see happening is all these obstructions to papal prerogatives that start getting put up, whatever they do, they only serve to then uh, show that the papal theory wins out eventually. And so this is why this idea of development of doctrine is so important because you've got these competing views, um, but they don't, the competition is not destined for eternity. And so eventually the papal, we, we would argue in the Catholic church that the papal theory, which begins in the beginning, it's there in the beginning, it's got its contest, it's got its competition, but eventually the other alternatives are put down. So I don't know if that makes any sense there. Um, go ahead and respond to that, and then I have one quick question, then we'll uh, start to wrap it up. So go ahead, Subdeacon. All right. Um, yeah, it makes total sense, Eric. I, I actually, I, I'm... I'm assuming, tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, what you're saying here, I think your book is going to be on this, right? Uh, yeah, it's a good part of it. Yeah, yeah uh, I can't wait for that. I've been telling everybody. It's going to be like Christmas for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't have anything to say to rebut anything you said. Um, uh, it's it's um, a fair thesis, and I'm, I'm willing to, I'm excited to read the book about it. Uh, I, I have a question, though, um, and this is maybe for for all of you guys or whoever knows about it. Um, what do you make of 
uh, the claim in the Ephesus book about um, the Pelagians appealing to Nestorius to the Sea of Constantinople because of Rome. Like they're they have they're at odds with Rome, so they're ap- appealing to Constantinople against Rome. Do you think that this had a role in Celestine um, not just taking sides? So, and me as Oriental Orthodox, I think it's a big deal that I'm about to say this, but I don't like it. I don't like how Ephesus 431 happened. Like I think Cyril should have waited for John to get there, and they should have had like a of, and then this is my to my Eastern Orthodox brothers watching, you guys always talk about how 449 is not canonical because of the stuff that <laughs> happened there. 431, more non-canonical stuff happened than 449. Um, so, so then in in 431, they didn't wait. Um, Rome obviously took the side anyway of Cyril, but um, do you think that this there were any any, because if, if like obviously speculation, but if they did wait, uh, my my uh, theory, which we will never know, my theory is Chalcedon would have never happened. They would have hammered all this miophysite, diophysite thing because both parties would have been in the same council, the two nature people, the one nature people, and we would and then and they would have all been in the same building in the same room talking about it. Um, and maybe another schism would have happened, but not Chalcedon. So uh, do you think that Celestine took the side of against the Pelagians? Because Leo was known to be a theologian. Celestine was not. So Celestine really uh, looked at, you know, the translations of the letters that Cyril smartly had them translated into Latin. The stories didn't. He was lazy. So uh, do you think that that had anything to do with Rome um, easily taking Cyril's side in, in the conversation? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that was for you. Or to Dan, uh, to, to uh, Elijah. Either one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I, I, so Julian of Eclanum is one example of the Westerners that went over to uh, Constantinople. And they were fed up with uh, they were fed up with the Augustine, really, um, and uh, and with the the judgment of Celestine and Zosimus on Pelagianism. And one of their complaints was that it was not done by an ecumenical council. Um, well, one of the complaints that Julian told Augustine was that it was there was no participation of Eastern bishops in the judgment of Pope Celestine and Pope Zosimus. Um, now, interestingly enough, Augustine wrote back to Julian and said, it's already been settled by the Apostolic See, which is already a, a development in Augustine's thought, because you could find anything from sola scriptura to conciliar supremacy to papal supremacy in Augustine. He's kind of wild-eyed. But uh, yeah, I think that, I don't know if that really has much of a role. I know Celestine was upset. Um but I'm, I don't know if that really, you know, because Cyril himself, um, he, he wasn't always going to be in the good graces of Rome. Um, that, was, that was dependent, right? Because even after the Council of Ephesus was done, and then you had the uh, agreement between John and Cyril, the formula of union, they call it in the books, uh, in 433, um, you have metropolitans in Antioch under the Patriarch of John who wrote appeals to, Cel- to Celestine saying, hey, this is not right. You got to undo this. Uh, I forget their names, but they wrote a long letter saying that the Bishop of Rome, even after the council and even after the formula of union, that the Bishop of Rome can call a timeout and suspend the validity of that formula of union. Now, what we find is that it was Pope Sixtus who wrote back because Celestine had passed away. And Sixtus III, um, or Christus III, I can't remember, but uh, he writes back saying he agrees with that formula and that's gonna wrap it up. So 
I don't know if that really has, you know, for what, you know, that they took Cyril's side that way. The league gates certainly did. That's for sure. Um, and they didn't quite like what John was doing in his synod out there in, in parallel competition with Ephesus. So it was just a nasty event. I think Cyril was a disaster. Let's just, let's just face the facts. Um, and it should have been done much differently. And, um, you know, so that's what I would say to that. Elijah, I think you had some comments there. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of times where we look at the, uh, the very details of these events and we sort of miss the forest for the trees. Uh, um, what I would say uh, is when we look at the church fathers and the way they understood the role of Peter um, to be set out in order for there to not be divisions in the church. So he's the head of the, the apostles. Um, and then they apply that to the Pope. Um, and even if they don't apply that to the Pope, let's say they just say, okay, Peter is the head of the church and, and he set out in order for there not to be divisions in the church. Obviously that's, that's going to transfer somewhere in the church so that there isn't any divisions in the church, not just in the apostles In the Roman Catholic church, we would say that that role goes to the Pope. Um, and so the way the fathers are interpreting that um, would apply to the Pope. Now, the way the Oriental Orthodox would interpret that, I, I really would be interested in hearing what Subdeacon would say to that, because they don't have a singular head in the church. That's the head of the whole church. They have heads in plural, uh, where you have, you know, Alexandrian Pope, you have the Antiochian Patriarch, and, and what have you. And so, and they're all equal and they have equal power and no one can tell anyone what to do. Um, but from a layman or even, you know, a priest or a bishop or what have you, how could one really see where the visible church is um, based off that ecclesiology compared to the church fathers, the way they looked at Peter, the way they applied Peter to the Pope. Um, and one example uh, we can look at is, St. Optatus, where he says, uh, you cannot then deny that you do know that upon Peter, <clears throat> first in the city of Rome, was bestowed the Episcopal Cathedra, on which sat Peter, the head of all the apostles, for which reason he was called Cephas, that in this one cathedra, unity should be preserved by all, lest the other apostles might claim each for himself separate cathedras, so that he would so that he who should set up a second cathedra against a unique cathedra would already be a schismatic and a sinner. So the whole point he's making here is that there is one head and it's a visible head. And the purpose for this head is so that no schisms can arise. And once you have a second head, then, then we're not going to know where the church is. Um, and, and he's one example, St. Jerome, St. Augustine, St. Cyprian. And we can, we can post these until our fa face turns blue. But yeah, we don't need to do that. But I guess my question is, how does an Oriental Orthodox understand these passages, not just from the scriptures, but from the fathers, how they applied these Petrine passages to the Pope for this reason? Um, and we would say that Christ instituted the papacy for this purpose. I mean, at least this is a major purpose for it, is so that we know where the, the church is. Uh, this is one way to know. So. That's all I had to say. Um, so I would have to look at each each quote. I think you and I have discussed them a, a few times. Uh, and I I don't know, like depending on the quote, we would have obviously if they're our saints, we would interpret it in a way that you know works for us. But um, in the case of in the case of how would someone know where the church is? No one likes this answer that I'm about to give. There isn't any apostolic uh, Christian, especially the online ones, the, the, the warriors online. They for sure would not like this. So, um, but it's just the truth of the, the this is like bottom line. Like I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to use a village you're familiar with in Iraq, Ihab, Baghdad. We'll use Baghdad as an example. So in Baghdad, it's a village, used to be Syriac Orthodox. Everyone woke up every Sunday morning for thousands of years and went to Syriac Orthodox liturgy every Sunday. The Bishop of Baghdad 100 or 150 years ago became Catholic. 
So Syriac, uh, uh, the church, the, the village now is Syriac Catholic. The people woke up every Sunday. They just went to their same church. Now they're in communion with Rome because their village, their bishop is Catholic. The, there's no way of, this is why I always like in recent people who talk to me on like a regular basis, notice like I've been talking about judgment day a lot lately, like a, like one of those crazy people, but but really, like, it's going to be interesting because how do you know it? N nobody does this. Like what we're doing here and what we're reading, this is very, very few people. And if we're talking about all the apostolic churches together, what is the percentage of people that are doing this? And then some of us do it at a greater degree than others. So, like, I'm nothing compared to, like, let's say Eric and Michael. They're doing it at like another level than I am. So and then there's there's people even there's like this range, but the most of the people are not right. So then they're just waking up every Sunday and going to whatever their church church, their dad was going to, or their grandpa was going to. And according to the village conversion of the Bishop, like I know other villages that, that this has happened to where they didn't even know they switched. They're like, Oh, we're Catholic now. When <laughs> like they didn't even realize. And then if you ask them, They'll be like, what do you mean the Pope is infallible? No, he's not. I'm like, okay, dude, whatever. Just uh, like stay in whatever you're doing. So this is just the reality of the situation. Like you don't, I don't think that we are waking up and looking at uh, what, wh uh, where is the church? This is maybe where what we should be doing, maybe Ihab, but nobody's doing that. And it, not only is no one doing that, I don't think it's expected of the laity to be theologians and historians and all these things. That what is expected of them is to participate in the sacraments, to do confession, to repent, to all of these things. Oh, uh, Elijah, my bad. <laughs> I've been calling you Ehab the whole time. Uh, so... We all know what you mean. What you mean here? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's just the reality of the situation. Like the Chaldean Church here, they are, and I'm not saying this just because it's on the air. Like it's, I think it's a joke. They call like I have friends that they call me and say, Daniel, we want to do confession with you. First of all, I'm not even a priest. You can't do confession with me. Second, I'm not Catholic, but for them. I'm an apostolic Christian wearing a cassock sometimes, uh, do like liturgical stuff in my church. And oh, it's all the same, whatever. Right. But this is like the reality of what we're living in. And the world is wherever the Eucharist is, wherever Virgin Mary is, wherever this stuff. So that's where we're supposed to go. That's just how it is. I don't know. We'll see on Judgment Day, I guess. You know, I think that there's a whole lot of truth to that. Yes, the average person doesn't need to become a theologian. But at some point, faith is important, right? Faith, hope, and charity, you have to have all three uh, theological virtues. And faith in what? You know, so when we start asking that question, some of these things are important. Now, I understand the average person isn't going to dive into it as much as we do. But um, at what point do we draw the line? You know, if you have somebody who says, you know, I have faith, I'm just practicing my faith, and I'm just being faithful, but do they believe in the divinity of Christ? I, I don't know. Who cares? I don't think we're going to go with that. We're going to say, wait, 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 I think we need to catechize you. Uh, I think we need to do some training here, because it does matter if you believe that Jesus is divine. So some of these things I think that we do need to um, tease out. Maybe, yeah. The creed. Was, yeah, it, it, and I would say all these things can be subsumed under the creed. Um, every, every Catholic would affirm that pretty much every one of our dogmas can be subsumed under one of those articles. Um, in fact, it's interesting, papal infallibility was something that Aquinas treated um, in his commentary on the creed. So he's dealing with it um, there before it was way before it was defined. Um, and he's dealing with it in the context of his uh, commentary on the creed. Anyways, um, so there's a, there's a, and there's a whole lot of things that we would both you and I both believe it's not explicitly in the creed. So we would have to explicate those and we would expect people in our congregations to adhere to them. So the question then would be, is something like people infallibility, something that our 
faithful should be adhering to, or should it be something they dismiss? So um, here's one question that I have though. I, I know we don't have a lot of time, so let to tease it out, but I really want to just get your quick thoughts on it. Um, Philip, the uh, presbyter, you know, Philip, the legate at Ephesus. Um, one of the things that has struck me is he's saying there um, in one of the sessions, I forget which one it was, but I have the quote pulled up in front of me. Session two or session three, it's something like that. It's session, um, two. It's session two, yeah. So here's what he says. Um, he's talking about the Pope and, of course, um, the fact that uh, Peter, well, let me just quote him. I think that would be better. There is no doubt, and in fact, it has been known in all ages that the holy and most blessed Peter, prince and head of all the apostles, pillar of the faith and foundation of the Catholic Church, received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the human race, and that to him was given the power of loosing and bonding sins, who even to this day and always, so to this day and always, lives and judges in his successors. And who are these successors? Our holy and most blessed Pope Celestine, the bishop, uh, is according to due order his successor and his place uh, and holds his place. So he's talking about the Bishop of Rome. He's his successor. He's the one who holds the office of Peter. It's the, of, of divine institution. It's not something that just came about through, you know, the political environment. Um, and he's saying that now and always he lives through his successors namely the Bishop of Rome. How do you, um, how do you understand that? Because I mean, you, you no longer have the Bishop of Rome. He's no longer in, you know, speaking through his successors in Rome. How do you account with, you know, what's being said here in Ephesus? Well, I think count it in the same way we would account someone um, losing their salvation. So God's grace is always there for you to cooperate with it but you don't have to cooperate with it. So uh, in the same way, this promise is for Rome, and we agree Rome is first among equals and all that other stuff. But as long as Rome, like, again, like I said, so the uh, it's when Jesus is talking to Peter, it's not just on his, his uh, uh, faith, but it's also his person, but it's also his faith. So, as long as Peter maintains his faith, we are right. We stay um, during, call it Nahire. It means the last on um, the evening of Palm Sunday. The evening of Palm Sunday, everyone goes back to church. All are off, um, and it's it's this whole right uh, based around Peter. Uh, and I encourage you, whoever's interested, to read it. Um, it says Peter is outside crying because he lost the keys to the kingdom when he denied Christ, of course. That's what we're talking about. And obviously he got them back, but he did lose them. So uh, in the same way, we believe that um, the Pope of Rome lost that promise. And I understand what you're saying. You know, if, if, if he's not living faithful to it, God's still faithful, but... You know, he's, he's not living it up to it. But it's interesting. He says, always lives and judges in his successors. Always lives. Not, not some dead pope with dead faith. Peter's always living in that sea. Uh, so he doesn't see it as this pope. You know, the pope could somehow fall away and no longer be. Uh, Peter's no longer living through him. He sees Peter always living through that sea. Now, he might be wrong. But at least that's the way I read it. Maybe it no, can be no. read differently. I mean, let's say he's right. Let's say, and um, then it, let's say, let's say not only he's right. Let's say he's right, and and the the Roman Catholic Church is right. There always then is that question at the end of the day, the hypothetical, maybe unrealistic question that what if the Pope becomes a manifest heretic? Mm -hmm. and then there's the debate of the one. One Catholic over here will say, well, that means as soon as sure. that happens, he stops being a pope. And the yeah, other so, so Peter is no longer speaking through him. But yeah. it's not like during that interim period, that interim period is going to last for 1,600, 1,700 years now, you know, 1,600 years, basically. Um, that would be pretty awkward that Peter's no longer living in his successors um, because, you know, this, this pope fell away due to heresy for 
1400 years. Whereas I could deal with, okay, you have a situation in which a Pope um, is guilty of heresy, he falls away, he's no longer the Pope. So Peter is no longer speaking through him. And we currently don't have a Pope. It's that interim period. Well, I mean, that that's not a big deal if we get a Pope pretty soon. Uh, but again, when you talk about 1600 years of no pope i think that that invalidates what's being said here whereas the situation you gave doesn't invalidate it it's no different than the interim period between a death uh, of one pope and an election of another pope yeah i see what you're saying i think we would then just say um it's not exclusive to him it would say yeah we it, it is him as long as he's orthodox but it's also alexandria it's also antioch and then it's optional of whether who wants to be in communion or not. Mm -hmm. The, um, the, I, I want to tease that out more. Maybe we can do a whole show on it because I want, want to discuss, because I would agree with you to an extent that some okay. of these things are there in, in every Bishop. Um, but I would say that there are some prerogatives given to the Pope that aren't there in every Bishop. And I think that Philip, um, was, was recognizing that, but I guess we would have to maybe do a, a sequel to this or something. And let's tease that out because I think that's a really important point that, uh, that uh, I think Oriental Orthodoxy would, would need to deal with. Uh, there are a couple questions here though, that I wanted to get to. This one is from her cue. It's for you, uh, Subdeacon. Does the Oriental Orthodox do any dialogue with Protestants? Was the Oriental Orthodox impacted by the Protestant Reformation? Um, if you're talking about in a formal way, no, like it, the, the impact, I mean, no, uh, but there are local uh, informal ways. Like you'll find a, a, like a, a parish that is more modernist than another parish, if, if you will. Um, uh, but for the most part, no, nothing, nothing universal or lasting. Um, it, it, there is though what I call an, like maybe this might upset Oriental Orthodox too, is a Vatican II um, influence on us in a way. Uh, it seems like ever since the end of that council, it affected us too for some reason, like things that came into the Roman Catholic Church kind of came into us. We started to shorten our rights a little bit and we started to wear shoes inside church and we started to... Um, uh, some parishes have instruments now um, and things like that. Uh, and uh, uh, regarding talking to Protestants, I know that in England there was an agreement uh, regarding the filioque between the Coptic uh, bishop there and the, the Anglicans. Um, and I can leave that up to, you, to whoever wants to debate it. Uh, I don't know anything about the filioque to talk about it. And, and another one for you, what Eastern Orthodox churches are in communion with the Oriental Orthodox churches? There is an agreement now between um, the Antioch churches, both of them, Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox, uh, going back to the 90s, early 90s. Uh, our patriarchs and synods signed it saying there is like intercommunion and and co-celebration and these types of things and um the antiochians got in trouble from the other eastern orthodox particular churches but they didn't care they stuck with it um uh, the th thing is it's kind of it, there's from what i understand from my antiochian friends is that they don't have the anathemas on us anymore so if that's true then that's logical that there wouldn't that there would be uh these agreements as long as those anathemas are not there okay uh eric how can we get comfortable with what is a legitimate development of doctrine versus accepting ancient heresy oh boy um just read from cover to cover uh saint john henry newman's essay on the development of christian doctrine for a long answer for a short answer, there's several tests for a legitimate development, but I'm just going to give a couple. It certainly has to have the Vincentian uh, attribute, which this is St. Vincent of Lorenz, uh, his rule for what is the apostolic faith, that it has to have universality, it has to have antiquity, and it has to have consent. That means we believe those things which were believed 
at all times and all places by everyone. Now, um, if you're a mathematician, you're going to quickly learn that this is more of a problem than it seems to be, uh, than it helps. But there's a general truth about it. So, you know, one of the commentators in the chat said that, you know, during the Arian heresy, the majority of the bishops, uh, you know, said Christ was a creature. I would disagree with that. I don't think that that was the majority. And I think that those who subscribe to that view, many did it in order to avoid exile. But uh, I don't have time to really go into that. What I would say is that the, the, the worship of Jesus as God still had universality, not just in particular points of time, but if you stretch it out to all times. So in the beginning of the early church to the first, second century, third century, uh, yes, you had a lapse in the fourth century, but then you have uh, a, a mighty victory with Emperor Theodosius the, the, the first in 381, and everyone's Nicene, uh, practically, I mean, in the Roman sense, the imperial Christian church, um, towards the end of the fourth century. Then the fifth century, everyone's Nicene. Sixth century, you have everyone's, you know, majority Nicene, and this is the view that it produres. It, 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 it has the test of time. It has the test of consent. It has the test of antiquity. Um, but there are lapses. So in the same way, I would say the papal office, as it is understood by the Catholic Church, um, it has antiquity because it's antique. It's there in the early church. Yes, it has its deniers. Yes, it has its resistances. But it also has its defenses. And um, so we see it growing, and, and, and I would argue that, um, and Subdeacon and I would probably agree more about the Chalcedonian church taking on this view um, in, in, for the later part of the first millennium. So that's one of the best ways to, to see if it's a leg legitimate. All right, so that's pretty much going to do it for today. Elijah, I know you were waiting there. Did you have any final comments? I want to give you a quick second there. Um, no, I mean, I just wanted to pinpoint back to what you were saying real quick about the uh, divine institution. Um, if, if Christ institutes the papacy and it only lasts 500 years, you know, I, to me, that just, to put it in a, the best way, is sort of looks ridiculous, kind of pinpointing back, but that's really all I wanted to say. Well, let's do a show talking about um, you know, teasing out the issue or some of these prerogatives that the uh, church fathers described um, that were given to the Bishop of Rome exclusive to Rome, or were they given to every bishop or were they given to the Pinsarchy or, or what? So I think that might be worth teasing out. And we, we also didn't talk about John Chrysostom and St. Miletius of Antioch. Mm -hmm. So those were two big ones that maybe in the future we could revisit. Yeah, I think that that would be really fun. So I think we'll we'll go ahead and um, put a sequel on the calendar. So everybody look for that. I want to thank you all for coming on. And I also want to thank you all for participating. Also, thank you for the super chats there, uh, Alan and also Hercule. And everyone, be sure to comment, like, and subscribe. Um, also, check us out at Reason. I'm sorry, patreon.com forward slash Reason at Theology. And uh, if you would like to support us. And, of course, go to ReasonAtTheology.com for more. Till next time, God bless you all.